Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to read from a book called Grinnell. It's by my friend John Tolliver, and it actually just won the Montana Book Award last week, so congratulations, John. Um, this book is a biography of a guy named George Bird Grinnell, and uh, Grinnell was a, an aristocrat from back east. He uh, went to Yale, good friends with Teddy Roosevelt. In fact, they were the uh, co-founders co of, or they were among the co-founders of the Boone and Crockett Club. Uh, Grinnell was the editor of Forest and Stream magazine for many decades, um, wrote many books about uh, Native Americans, uh, but his main uh, passion in life, uh, he sort of worked back east all most of the year, but every year he would come out west, and of course in those days it was a grueling trip, um, but he would come out west and <clears throat> explore the mountains, uh, spend time with the Native Americans. He became very close to uh, many of the tribes and was friends with Sitting Bull and other members of various tribes. Um, he was part of one of Custer's expeditions and was actually supposed to be part of the cavalry expedition that ended up, um, you know, getting slaughtered. So he had an incredibly interesting life. Uh, but most of his efforts in the West uh, tended to be toward conservation. He uh, was uh, very instrumental in establishing Glacier National Park. And of course, most some of you have heard of Grinnell Glacier. That's named after him. Grinnell College is not named after him. But uh, he's uh, sort of been overlooked as far as someone who had a huge impact on the West. So John put together this amazing biography, which is incredibly well written. Uh, every good biography needs to be well researched. And John did that. He spent years reading through all of Grinnell's papers, um, thousands and thousands of documents. But um, the main thing about this book that makes it uh, an, an incredible achievement is how readable and accessible it is. It's not um, that kind of research could lead to a very dry textbook type uh, story, but John focuses on the, the personal in a way that makes this book very readable. It's one of the best biographies I've ever read. So this is going to be uh, the fruit from the introduction, first, just a couple of pages from the introduction. <clears throat> Grinnell by John Tolliver. Another split in the story of George Bird Grinnell must not be overlooked. For all his curiosity about the external world, there was one realm he hesitated to explore, let alone share. He guarded his inner self. A man's appearance, his deeds, his whereabouts, his friends and relations all lend shape and shading to his profile. And if he leaves enough behind, if he leaves behind enough artifacts and the right sort of writing, these can shed light on his disposition mental, emotional, even sexual. With Grinnell, we see whom he projected himself to be, how he wished himself to be regarded and remembered. Quote, those of us who have been trying to do something for the public welfare act as we do because we have the vision to see what ought to be done, he explained. And having seen this, self-respect demands that we do our duty as we see it, unquote. This sense of decency and decorum was expressed best through sportsmanship by the Boone and Crockett Club credo, which Grinnell codified and embodied. A good sportsman was encouraged to moderate his natural impulse. In the gluttony of the Gilded Age, such self-control separated a gentleman from a robber baron or a game hog. Yet Grinnell hardly kept his lamp under a bushel. Although he shrank from giving after-dinner speeches and sat for formal photographs only under protest, he mixed well at clubs and banquets and around campfires, and he could be full-throated in board meetings and congressional hearings. His fastidiously tended handlebar mustache suggested more than a little vanity. In New York and Washington, his public image as a doer and as a man who knew the Indian had gone and had gone west when the west was still up for grabs, meant a great deal to him. Possibly Grinnell was simply too busy and proper to indulge in self-reflection. 
Or was there something he wanted to avoid reflecting upon? With the unsaid, was there something unsayable? Be that as it may, he left behind more than a few clues to his nature. Grinnell and Elizabeth had no children of their own, but as the eldest of six siblings, he became the patriarch of the clan of the clan after his father died in 1891. The family lived side by side in Audubon Park and shared a farm in Connecticut. Small wonder then that Grinnell looked forward to extended sojourns in the West and immersed himself in native culture. By devoting so much time and attention to Indians, he might have believed that he was climbing out of one confining picture frame and into the expansive exoticism of another. Yet comparisons between the two spheres of his life, as well as the judgments he passed on on each, if not on himself, are revelatory. This biography draws from 40,000 pages of Grinnell's correspondence some 50 diaries and notebooks documenting his Western travels, 35 years of forest and stream articles and editorials, and much, uh, much more. Then too, we have his unfinished autobiography, seven autobiographical novels written for boys, the Jack books, and hundreds of other jigsaw pieces that accumulated until a heart attack invalidated him in 1929. What's missing? Grinnell was a diligent letter writer. <clears throat> he answered his mail punctually for fear that he might fall behind. Even after he left Forest and Stream and moved his office to his library on 15th Street, his, his routine was to dictate a letter to a stenographer who typed it up made a copy by way of an often smudgy transfer process called letterpress, and bound it chronologically in a letter book after posting the original. Thus, nearly 50 years of Grinnell's correspondence have been preserved. In shorter supply are letters written to Grinnell, and nearly all letters he wrote by hand when he was away from his office. Pity, his penmanship is superb. Alas, only a few letters between Grinnell and Elizabeth survive. Perhaps others were lost. Perhaps she did not consider them worth including in the papers she donated to the Connecticut Audubon Society after his death. Or perhaps she discarded them for more personal reasons. Her presence in the account that follows suffers from their absence. Few deep secrets are overtly revealed in Grinnell's papers, but careful reading teases out several concealed memories and regrets that he was not inclined to utter aloud or express through a stenographer. Secrets from whom? His wife, his family, his peers, the public, himself? We can only build the dinosaur with the bones we dig up. Thanks. I hope you all have a great day.